I could, I, I'd like to get started uh, first by noting that there is a Google Doc I've left in the chat room uh, that everybody can edit to add questions to pitch at particular presenters and you get a chance to actually ask those questions um, yourself if audio and everything is working. And, uh, but what I'd mainly like to do, um, Handy can give the introduction to the workshop, um, but I just want to put in a plug in for the organizers um, of this and how much I've appreciated working with them to deliver all of this to you. So Lee Carmody, Melissa Handel, Lauren Chan, Lynn Shermel, Duccio Calveri, Tarini Naravani, and Robert Warren and Jessica Singer. Um, you've all been a, a real help. If you're on the call <laughs> right now, uh, straight to you. Thanks so much for helping uh, organize these four sessions and reviewing all the papers and, um, and uh, suggestions for actually breaking this up into um, two and a half hour uh, chunks of time. It's all worked out so well uh, so far. And uh, so I really appreciate your help and kudos to you. So over to Handy uh, to, to uh, introduce the session. Thank you, Damien. And I echo Damien. Thank you all uh, to the organizing committee for this really um, educating event. Uh, this was really helpful for me and I hope everyone to see all the different aspects of the food ontologies realm. Um, I would like to introduce myself and uh, thank you everyone for being here today. I am Hande Kuchukmikinti and uh, my research has been about ontologies and how they can be built concordantly so they can work together and they can be applied to fair data, artificial intelligence and machine learning applications for a better understanding and analyzing this data. I am a computer scientist by training, but I've always worked in multidisciplinary teams. I really love that. Uh, currently, I'm a research scientist at Collaborative Drug Discovery. And at CDD, we have various projects um, related to fair data. And one of them is BioHarmony project. And with that, uh, we built an annotator that uses uh, different ontologies in the background and machine learning methods to help annotate plain text that is human readable and make it machine ready. It's currently focusing on preclinical and postclinical data, but it's a versatile tool that can be applied to any data. Um, so today's presentations are all about tools and methods. I am really excited to hear all of them. And uh, we are going to start with Dr. Ian Herricks. Um, and uh, the presentations are gonna be about 10 minutes long. Uh, and um, so far, I think everybody uh, knows that they're gonna be on time, but if something happens, I will be warning them in about uh, when they have about two minutes left. Um, so I'd like to briefly introduce Dr. Herrick um, before he starts. He's a full professor at Oxford University, Department of Computer Science, and he's a visiting professor in the Department of Informatics at the University of Oslo. His research interests include logic-based knowledge representation and reasoning, semantic technologies, and he's an author of the OIL and DML plus OIL and OWL languages. And he was also uh, chairing the session uh, that standardized OWL2. And he developed many algorithms and standards uh, and optimization techniques and reasoning systems uh, that underpin OWL applications. Um, if you use many of the reasoners that are in Protege, uh, you, you've used this work. And he is a fellow of the Royal Society, a member of Academia Europea, a fellow of the European Association for Artificial Intelligence, and a fellow of the British Computer Society. I, for one, am really looking forward to his talk today. Dr. Herrick is going to talk about how we might be able to save much valuable ontology engineer and domain expert time uh, if we can use machines to help us 
identify some missing information errors in the large ontologies. Without further ado, Dr. Herricks. Okay, thanks very much, Andy, for the kind introduction. Uh, I'll share my screen now. I think that's the way to go. Let me just try to find the actual presentation. Okay, let's see if this is going to work. So are you seeing that? Yes, we are. Yes. Good. Okay, then I'll get straight into it. So this, uh, as, as Handy just mentioned, is a talk about tool support for ontology design and quality assurance. It's joint work with Zhao Yan Chen, who's a colleague at Oxford, and Jae Hun Lee uh, from Samsung Electronics. So, um, yeah. We all know ontology design and development is a really hard problem and uh, it requires input not only from domain experts, but also from ontologists, people who know uh, how to design ontologies. Um, and in spite of the fact that it's such a hard problem and the ontologies are really being more and more widely used these days, not just in uh, areas like this one, but even uh, quite extensively in industry these days, tool support still quite limited and hasn't progressed all that much in recent years. I mean, Protégé is, is still by far the most widely used tool. Uh, and I mean, kudos to, to, to them for the uh, incredible uh, amount of work they put into developing and maintaining kudos. Uh, protege, which we'd really be lost without. But I mean, there's a limit to what uh, protege can do for supporting correct design. It ensures, of course, the syntax is correct, uh, but it doesn't really do a lot to 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 support the actual, you know, good design of of ontologies. And as well as getting the basic design right, the whole sort of QA process is particularly challenging. I mean, typically really that just uh, involves checking by the people who are building the ontology as they go along. You know, maybe they have uh, some sort of methodology for doing that, but it, it's, it's really difficult. We do have reasoning support and that is extremely useful, but that's also quite limited in what it can do for us. And the reasons for that on the one hand are the OWL and other first order ontology languages that are mainly what people are using are monotonic. And what that means is that taking uh, information away won't ever cause more entailments. So if you miss something out, that won't lead to an inconsistency. On the other hand, ontologies are typically highly under constrained. So for example, it's quite often the case that you see few, if any, disjointness statements between classes. And this general under constrainedness means that also uh, often it's the case that even saying incorrect things in the ontology won't lead to inconsistencies either. So, you know, reasoning it's good, but it has its limitations where QA is concerned in particular. So with all this in mind, we've been thinking about uh, tool support uh, for ontology uh, development in general. Uh, and we've been doing a lot of things uh, you know, with machine learning and other statistical approaches. But in this case, I'm gonna tell you something about uh, some work we did specifically addressing this ontology QA problem. And the basic idea is why not use another ontology as a kind of surrogate for domain experts. So of course we could employ a kind of huge team of domain experts to crawl all over our ontology and check everything, but that's pretty expensive. So maybe we could try just using another ontology to do that. And the basic idea is we take our ontology that we want to QA and we select another ontology that covers a similar or overlapping domain. Then we use one of the many available alignment tools to align O1 and O2. And basically what that means is uh, we can then use O2 to sort of check the modeling of O1 by basically comparing how things are modeled in, in O1 and O2. And then, well, 
some of our work actually we've been exploring automated correction but in this work so far we're only really envisaging the idea of reporting suspicious looking things differences in the modeling back to human experts so they can then focus their valuable time on looking at, at those things so just to show you in a bit more detail how that would work we did a little case study using Hellis and food on so as many of you probably know Hellis is uh, I think it it stands for the healthy lifestyle ontology something like that anyway and it covers food health and uh, other such things so it has quite a good overlap with food on we used our log map tool to do the alignment but basically you could use any alignment tool that you like uh, and what this tool does is it identifies mappings between the two ontologies and basically a mapping is actually an axiom that says uh, that's an equivalence axiom saying that uh, a class in food on is equivalent to a class in Hellis. I mean, this doesn't make it be absolutely true because these mapping tools are not perfect, but hopefully if they're reasonable, it does, uh, you know, a, a, a reasonable job. And in any case, we don't care if everything is completely correct because our goal is just to sort of feed back to the human experts some areas that they might look at in more detail. So then how do we use these mappings to compare the two ontologies? So the way that works is we use a reasoner, Hermit in this case, uh, to classify food on on its own and compute the subclass hierarchy of food on. And then we do the same thing with the ontology we get by union, unioning together food on, Hellis, and the mappings. So note the mappings are axioms, just like any other axioms in the ontology. So actually, we can just concatenate those three things together, and we still have an ontology, and we can classify that using Hermit. And then we look for cases where we see a subsumption relationship between classes that holds in this combined ontology, but that doesn't hold if we only consider food on on its own. So this sort of suggests that then there's some difference in the modeling between Hellis and food on. So some examples of what we got out of that process, the um, log map computed several hundred mappings. And when we then did this modeling comparison process, we actually got about 500 examples of pairs of concepts that were differently classified in food on than in the union ontology. And a couple of examples of mappings were that uh, LogMap reckoned that Hellis soy products is the same thing as food on soybean food product and that Hellis soy milk is the same thing as food on soybean milk. And as I say, there were several hundred of these mappings. And then interesting pairs of classes that were identified using this process where the modeling seems to differ somewhat, are, for example, well, soybean milk. Uh, in food on, it's not the case that soybean milk is a subclass of soybean food product. But that does hold if we use the, uh, the combined ontologies. And actually, this seems to be somewhat problematical in the case of food on. Intuitively, I would certainly expect soybean milk to be a subclass of soybean food product. And that could actually be pretty important if we were looking to use food on to alert people to possible um, allergy issues and, and so on. Uh, another example was uh, matake mushroom, which isn't a mushroom vegetable food product in food on alone, but it is if we use the union ontology. And, and basically there seems to be some inconsistency with the way individual mushroom types are um, classified in food on. Some of them are classified in the kind of food source hierarchy, and some of them are classified in the food product hierarchy. And finally, we noticed that there were a whole bunch of suspicious things around vitamins. And when we look closely, we discover that food on has multiple vitamin hierarchies with different spellings and 
capitalizations. So there's there's definitely something going on there. So I think I'm roughly at the end of the 10 minutes. So just to sum up, seems a promising idea, but there's quite a bit we would need to do in future to make this be really usable. At the moment, it's just pretty much of a lash up and we need to build a proper tool. There are a few technical issues. Explanation would be important. So when we got these suspicious classes back, it actually took me really ages to sort of look at the different ontologies in protege and try and figure out what the hell was going on uh, and also vitamins for example threw up numerous errors and it would be good to sort of cluster them together and just say look you know there's something going on in the vitamin space and of course we would need to uh, evaluate on a wider range of ontologies before we could declare that it's it's really useful so i think i'm done as i understand the process we save questions for the end of the session right that is correct. Thank you so much. For your... Okay, so I'm done and I'll hang on and answer any questions at the end. Thank you so Bye. much. We appreciate that. It was very interesting. I was very impressed by this uh, kind of a semi-automated method that ultimately gives the power to the domain experts, but then helps them hopefully and saves them time. Um, that was great. Thank you. Uh, like Dr. Herricks mentioned, the questions will be at the end. The link to the document for you to write down your questions is in the chat. And um, please let me know if you have problems reaching it. And we will continue our session today uh, with Dr. Patrice Bush. I hope I'm uh, pronouncing this right. He is a research engineer in the computer science department uh, with the INRA. All right, and uh, thank you for taking over the screen. And uh, he uh, is the head of the Knowledge Engineering Group at the IATE Research Unit in Montpellier. Uh, Patrice's research interests are data and knowledge integration guided by ontologies for decision support purposes. Uh, main applications uh, concern food and bioproducts, especially the new generation of biosource food packaging. He'll be presenting a new alignment method today, and uh, it's based on synthetic and semantic approaches, and we'll talk about uh, a real use case that involves two food composition databases. I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, Dr. Bush. Is this, is this the right way to pronounce your name? I'm so sorry. Yes, Patrice Bush, yes. Bush is nice okay. pronunciation. Okay. Thank you for your kind introduction. Um, I will present uh, a new uh, alignment method based on Foodon as a pivot ontology. Um, this, uh, this work comes from um, a project with uh, some industrial partners in France. Um, and the context is a uh, nutritional uh, score assessment of a recipe. And a, a question, uh, the question we wanted to, to deal with is how to deal with missing information uh, for a given ingredient in a given food composition database. Like for instance, uh, you don't have information about iron, vitamin B12, things like that. And the, um, the possible solution we have worked on is to retrieve missing information uh, from a similar ingredient from another uh, food composition database that we call FCDB in my slides. And how do you intend to do that? We, we use Foodon as pivot uh, to link the food product uh, vocabularies used in uh, I use FCDBs and in my talk uh, we have made some assessment with SQL and uh, USDA. And uh, we also use uh, Langwall as back background knowledge, and uh, we use both uh, sources of information to determine for each uh, product of uh, FCDB, uh, the closest product and family in Foodon. Here in this slide, you can see uh, a screenshot of uh, a prototype we call the MultiDB Explorer. In this uh, web app, uh, we, uh, we integrated uh, uh, seven FCDBs, uh, including SQL and USDA. And you can see here that uh, we can query this uh, integrated database using the a name of a food product. Here I put a French term, courgette purée. 
And uh, uh, in the bottom of the slide, you can see that we found one, uh, one result uh, coming from the French uh, database, namely SQL. If you click on this uh, food product before you come to this new screen, well, you can see that uh, we have uh, the lingual description of this uh, food, courgette purée, uh, which is a set of uh, facets uh, expressed in the lingual uh, standardized uh, vocabulary. And here we, we see that the courgette purée is fully heat treated. It is one of the facets. Here we suppose that uh, we don't, we have a missing information in the SQL database, of, for instance, about vitamin C. And uh, what you will see is that uh, thanks to the algorithm we have developed first, uh, we uh, could uh, uh, put uh, um, this courgette puree in the food and family squash vegetable food product, in which you can also see that um, other terms, other foods from, coming from USDA have also been uh, put. Uh, for instance, uh, if we click on the squash, winter, corn, cooked, boiled, mashed, without salt. Uh, then you come to the screen and here uh, you can find the uh, detailed composition, nutritional composition of uh, this food. And here uh, we have the value for vitamin C, which is 6.5 milligram per 100 gram. Uh, it's uh, what uh, uh, now I will give you uh, uh, some details about uh, this uh, alignment method. Uh, the, what we want to do is to find the closest product and family in Fudon for each product of a, a given FCDB. And as you said, the approach is, is to combine two kinds of information. First, uh, syntactic information, product name label uh, in English, and also the semantic description of a food product uh, using language facets, as I showed you before on an example. And what we do is to compute uh, a similarity score, which is uh, an aggregation of two scores, a semantic one. We, 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 we compute using the a comparison between lingual facets and a syntactic score, comparing the labels themselves. Here, just a quick uh, information on uh, the way we compute the semantic score. In, in fact, uh, uh, this semantic measure is a weighted sum of uh, similarities between each facet of uh, both products uh, we compare, one from uh, uh, the FCDB and the other one from Fudan. Uh, if, so, if, two, if the two facets uh, are the same, uh, we put the similarity to one. And uh, if two facets which are compared are different, uh, the, the similarity depends on the length of the shortest path between uh, both facets in the lingual hierarchy. Here in this slide, just a, a little example to explain the, the intuition. And we, we want to compare the product P with uh, product P1 and P2. You see that for facet 8, the same thing, the similarity is 1. But for facet B, uh, we have different concepts. And here, uh, our similar, similarity measure will say that uh, similarity between P and P1 is, is, is greater than similarity between P and P2, because uh, um, uh, B11 is closest in the, in the path to, to B12 uh, compared to B21. Here, uh, it is a complete example. Uh, here, what we want to do is to find correspondences uh, in Fudon for the SQL product the co cooked pork shoulder. Before here, I presented on the right part of the screen an excerpt of um, Fudon hierarchy. And uh, we, we have in red the, 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 similarity score, the, score associated, the similarity score associated with uh, uh, the, the different terms of um, of Fudon, and you see here that the greatest score is uh, for uh, pork shoulder cooked curd. And after we determine the closest family in Fudon as being the family of the closest product. Um, now I'm back, I'm coming back to the use case. I said that what we want to do is to be able to uh, uh, to, to, diff, to find this, to, to, to replace missing the information for a given ingredient uh, reusing. Uh, uh, information which is available in another database uh, for a similar ingredients. Before we did this uh, work for SQL and USDA, and uh, here uh, the method we used is first to 
align a SQL food concept and USDA food concept on food on, and after by transitivity to determine automatically alignment between SQL food products and USDA ones. And uh, the use case was to find in USDA database values associated with nutrients, uh, vitamin C, B12, and iron, where, when they are not known in SQL for a given food. Uh, we did that on a, a golden standard of 99 SQL terms, for which uh, we at, le at least one, uh, for which at least one of the values associated with the free nutrients uh, is not known in SQL and for which at least one similar term was, can be found in USDA. And here you have the results. Uh, for, uh, we, we found uh, uh, 60, uh, 76 alignments uh, which have been considered relevant of the 99. And for those 76 relevant alignments, we could find 91% of the known values in SQL, which has been enriched by values from USDA, and 96 of known values in SQL, which has been uh, have been completed by values from uh, USDA. Then, as a conclusion, uh, the, this work is currently submitted to a, a, a journal, EGIS, and also this prototype MultiDB Explorer is uh, an extension of Food Explorer from uh, Eurofear with uh, a new functionality, I mean, a similar food search. Um, due, after the, the project, which is now finished, the Mitilab French project, we have discussion when we've uh, one of the partners, the uh, Axe system, um, who is interested to reuse this uh, work. And uh, also we envisage uh, other possible uh, discussion and valorization with uh, the French uh, nutritional agency, ANSES, Eurofear, and also uh, in high food platforms. Uh, also, we are interested in reusing the data we have integrated in a, a MultiDB Explorer for uh, modeling for, for predictions in order to, to, to define prediction models uh, of O2 CO2 solubility in food. As uh, I mentioned, I am interested in um, tools in order to design new food packaging, and it, it will be useful for that. And also uh, concerning the alignment method, it could of course be enhanced. And uh, one of the questions we are interested in is to see how we can learn from alignment correction done by annotators, and also to see if it's possible to replace the background knowledge lang wall by FoodX2. Thank you very much for your, your attention. Thank you so much. This was very interesting, and I appreciate you being on time as well. Um, so again, the questions are going to be in the document. I will send the link again in a minute. We will continue with the same uh, research in it, I think, uh, with uh, Dr. Liliana uh, Ivanescu. Uh, Liliana is an assistant professor in computer science at Agro Paris Tech in the Paris Institute of Technology for Life and Environmental Sciences. Uh, she is also a member of the research team at INRA, uh, RNA AE, sorry, in the French National Institute for Agriculture and Environment. Uh, Liliana is also a co head of the French Research Network on Integration of Heterogeneous Data and Sources and Ontologies. Her research interests are building ontologies for different domains and using semantic web standards uh, and W3C recommendations to do so. Liliana is currently participating in the process of building the core ontology for the processes, process and observation ontology, PO square, um, that allows the modeling of both transformation processes and experimental observations. Our love for trying to model the processes is how I met Liliana earlier. Uh, her paper published last year in the International Dairy Journal and uh, shows the benefits of using the core process and observation ontology for data integration, aiming to evaluate sustainability challenges in cheese production. Uh, take it away, Liliana. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Thank you. Okay, so uh, my talk is uh, about the joint work between the three teams from INRAE, uh, the same uh, as the, in the uh, talk uh, just before. Uh, INRAE is the French National Institute for Agriculture, Food and Environment, 
And uh, uh, other, uh, my, Juliette Dibi and myself uh, are teachers and, at a French university, which is named AgroParisTech. Um, our story started five years ago when we were involved in a project aiming to formulate a well-balanced product with acceptable qualities using eco-friendly production processes. Uh, in Raya experts were involved and available data were about dairy gels. There were mainly research data on the real and model cheeses. Uh, here is an example of a question we want to be able to answer. Which hard, che hard cheese sample has the highest value for taste intensity uh, and uh, aroma intensity? Three years ago, we were involved in another project, the one that Patrice presented just before, aiming to produce nutritional fact labels for manufactured meat product. Uh, an industrial partner, Solina, was involved in Rye experts and the available data were about sausage making. Uh, here's an example of a question where we wanted to be able to answer, how many knacks have an adhesiveness higher than 2.0? So our solution proposed during this project is a workflow for data representation and integration. So first we represent knowledge using the domain ontology, which specialize and extend the core ontology. We annotate data with concept from the domain ontology and we store data in a repository. We build two dedicated tools, PO2 Manager and Spock. Uh, this workflow is implemented using semantic web technology. Uh, excuse me, Liliana, we, we, we don't see your slides. It's ah, not. Why? It is only on the first one. It is all ah, st still it's... fixed on the first one. Oh, that's strange. Because it is just a moment. I don't know what to do. Would you like to stop sharing and then reshare, perhaps? Um, I don't know what it means. Okay. Uh, do you want to start sharing again? Share again, okay. Do you see it? Uh, we cannot see your screen, we see you. Okay. And the beautiful sunflower in the background. Let's try other thing. Let's try to share this desktop. No, just this There we go. We got Is it. Is it okay? Yes. I, I can. Uh, okay. Okay. So. Um, just take your time. So if you want to go. Uh, oh, are you? Do you need that I came back? I think it was just a story. If you can, uh, if you are on the fourth slide, I think it's okay. Have you? Do you see the fourth one? Yes, that's the one okay. we're seeing. Yep. Okay, I sorry. Mean, if, if you want to backtrack a little bit, you're more than welcome to. Uh, uh, I, I can do this if you want. Let's see if it works. So I will, I, well, I'm back to the second slide. I hope it's okay. So the, um, the slide was to present one of the, the, our projects that uh, give the idea to do what we have done in, this, in the project. And what is interesting here is that we have uh, complexes and questions that need to explore data for very different domains in cheese production, sensory perception and life cycle analysis. The second project was about uh, produce nutrition fact labels for manufactured meat products. And this is the same project that uh, presented uh, Patrice just before about uh, finding uh, missing information about uh, nutri nutrient in food. And this is uh, my, my uh, example in the presentation will concern this, uh, uh, this project. Uh, uh, the data we have is about sausage making. Uh, and uh, the, the solution we propose that is available for, that is suited for all the, 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 the both of the project is this integrated uh, workflow where I want to show um, what we have done. So first we represent, we have, the, our solution is the following. We have, we, we have a domain ontology that specialize and extend the core ontology 
um, we annotate data uh, with this the domain from this uh, with the concept from this domain ontology and we store it in a repository and for doing this we have we uh, needed to build two dedicated tools that uh, i will present today po2 manager and spock and all this workflow is implemented using semantic web technology technologies rdf ol and spark so I will start with a very so short presentation about the core ontology, then I will present our tools. So let's start with an over overview of the process and observation core ontology. Uh, we identify the following representation needs. We want to represent transformation processes or itineraries having a succession of steps. We need to represent components or ingredients as input and outputs of steps. We want to represent the material involved in the transformation process. And finally, uh, observation about all of this. Um, here you have a, uh, an excerpt of the PO2 ontology. It is based on standards like BFO, SOSA, and TIME ontology. The, the concept in blue concerns the representation of steps and processes. The concepts in green uh, are about uh, components or ingredients. Uh, the orange concepts is about, uh, concerns transfer observation. And the concepts in gray are about numerical or qualitative results of an observation. Our ontology is available on, on AgroPortal and has the 67 concepts and 79 relations. Let's move to the second part. The first objective of our tool, PO2 Manager, is to assist domain experts in building a domain ontology by extending the core ontology and reusing semantic uh, uh, resources. Uh, the searching functionality allows one to type the name of a concept. Here is sausage seasoning. I hope you don't hear the, my, my neighbors. Um, sausage seasoning uh, to select some existing resources. Uh, the result of the search is uh, the results of the search are displayed in a table. And if the uh, user find a useful concept, like for instance, uh, sausage seasoning from food on and wants to reuse in, in his ontology. Uh, our tool helps in adding this concept in the hierarchy and stores as an exact match the information about the reused concept, a food on concept in this case. Uh, the second um, objective of our tool, PO2 Manager, is to annotate data with concepts from the domain ontology and to store them into a database. Let's take the example of the sausage making itinerary. This is, a, uh, this is its description as a flowchart in French, in French, as given by our industrial partner. The first uh, yellow box describes the ingredients the input of the whole process. The steps are in blue and the green boxes are observation to be done during the process. Let's see how it looks like once it, uh, how this itinerary looks like once it has been represented in PO2 Manager. The five steps of the sausage making itinerary are displayed on the right. And this is the third, is first itinerary in the list of sorted, of a stored itinerary which when choosing the step here, food cartridge process on the left, you can see the material used during the step. In this case, it is a cutter and all the ingredients are uh, named here component with the quantity and the unit for each one. When choosing the step controlled atmosphere storage process, there are observation for texture and in this case, we have three observation with numerical value and units. Uh, we built a, a second tool, which is Spock, uh, for querying data stored in the repository. It proposed a set of predefined Sparkle queries for users who don't know Sparkle. 
and there is an advanced mode for writing complex Sparkle queries. Let's take the example I give at the beginning of my talk, how many knacks have an adhesiveness value higher than 2.0. Um, uh, using the Spock interface, we have first to choose a data set, then to filter on the steps, then to filter the transformation process, then uh, filter on the step, but it's not the case in this example. And finally, you filter on the property, in this case is adhesiveness. And once you execute the form, uh, the result will be displayed in a table. Here we have two knacks with an adhesiveness value greater than 2.0. The conclusion of uh, my talk is that we propose the core ontology for representing processes, components, and observation, and we specialize it in three different domains. We built a repository implemented in GraphDB having 5.5 million RDF tri triples and storing almost 1,000 itineraries. Our first dedicated tool, PO2 Manager, assists the main experts in building domain ontology. It is a standalone application implemented in Java. And finally, we build a, a web application spoke for querying data. Our further work, the first issue is about the task of integration. We will continue to store and query itineraries from the transform in RIA department specialized in food bioproducts and uh, waste, but also from food industry. The second direction for future work is to continue to explore the use of the ontology to learn probabilistic relational models and to discover causal relation. And uh, we will continue to explore how to use our data in decision support tools by studying the impact of process variables on the quality of the end product. Some published results are about how to compute indicators or to formulate well-balanced food products. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Liliana. And I, I'm sorry that we had a slight technical difficulty at the beginning, but um, that, uh, I'm glad it was not, not a big problem. Uh, thank you again. This was very interesting. I'm actually looking forward to exploring these tools that you presented. Uh, a little bit more myself. Uh, next up is uh, Grunder Gosal. Uh, Grunder is a researcher and academician and computer professional with more than 18 years of experience. He's earned uh, his master's and PhD in computer science. Uh, for the last two years, he's been working at the ICO lab at UBC. <clears throat> He's been contributing as an NLP and semantic technology researcher there and leading the LexMapper project for developing a rule-based text mining tool that parses the short free text sample metadata. It maps the identified entities to terms from selected domain ontologies and classify these as per institution specific class, uh, classification schemas. Gurinder is also leading a task to provide NLP-based harmonization tools for, uh, by focusing on the narrative content. Uh, his, he has previously developed a very large ontology, Prokino, at University of Georgia in the United States. And uh, today, he will be talking more about the LexMapper project. Gurinder, if you're ready, we're ready to, I think. Thanks, and uh, I'm audible? Yes. Thanks, hello everyone. Uh, so today I will be, as I told, I will be presenting uh, about LexMapper. Uh, so LexMapper is a rule-based uh, anti-leaking and ontology-driven classification tool that is actually focusing on, uh, specifically on the short free text entities or phrases, whatever you call them. A uh, little background about the LexMapper. Uh, LexMapper was built to address the needs of our in-house uh, food on and gen API ontology users. Uh, when they wanted some kind of a tool, uh, so they, for their application, they can link their data or text to ontology terms. 
And uh, the pressing need came when US FDA's genome tracker, they wanted to, uh, they wanted to use our ontologies uh, for standardizing the short phrases which were describing the food pathogen source data. Uh, they wanted to use the ontology terms uh, in their foodborne disease surveillance and outbreak investigations, which they do. And afterwards, uh, LexMapper has been also further extended to, to provide the ontology-driven classification mechanism also uh, for the specimen data. Again, we were using the genome tracker data set and uh, following a if set classification schema. So how uh, we approached uh, developing LexMapper, we looked at the uh, biosample data sets uh, primarily consisting of NCBO, NCBI biosamples and uh, looked at what are the challenges in mapping those to the ontology terms. And we found that like there are very specific challenges in the case of short phrases. And also our domain was having a very focused uh, semantic domain. Uh, challenges, uh, uh, when we talk about the challenges, you know, like uh, in the case of the biomedical domain, there are well reported challenges uh, regarding that tax mining are there. But in the case of short phrases, we found that like uh, there are ingrammatical inaccuracies, uh, for example, inconsistent use of case, inconsistent use of punctuations, arbitrary ordering of the tokens, uh, loose formation, and frequent use of abbreviations. And if the abbreviations are used, also they are not standard abbreviations. Also, the context was kind of missing or ambiguous because surrounding text was not there. And in, uh, if we look at the domain-specific challenges in our uh, biosample domain the challenge, was also like there is a non-English uses of food names, for example, uh, for representing those food descriptions. So we we came up, uh, we thought like a rule-based approach having well designed or defined manually rules and uh, having some wide ranging lexical resources that should work well. And eventually it worked well in our case uh, for the uh, application we built. And uh, afterwards, like I told you, LexMapper has been equipped with the functionality to classify the phrases about uh, as per the third party classification schemas. And we represent the third party class, uh, classes or categories uh, uh, characterized in terms of the ontology high level classes, which we call them buckets. And we use that, those buckets actually to classify into third party categories. I will sh uh, show you that in one of my slides. So for this particular application about the biosample domain, uh, we use these sources like uh, we mapped uh, the terms to two underlying uh, key underlying ontologies, food on and gen appeal, which were representing the biosample domain, food biosample domain especially. And uh, of course they contain also the terms from, uh, relevant terms from the other ontologies imported from uh, Envo, Uberon, NCB or Texan, for example. And we also created, locally created uh, domain specific lookup tables for abbreviation, normalization, spelling correction, additional synonyms. Of course, the synonyms are in the ontologies. Ideally, uh, those are in the synonym uh, in the ontologies, but uh, we found that like many synonyms are missing in the ontologies. So if we, we could use those synonyms also to enable the mapping. So we have this lookup table also there for, for our particular domain. And of course, the non-English food terms uh, translation lookup table was also there. So this, uh, if we want to look at high level architecture of FlexMapper, uh, there are two key components here, the mapping pipeline and the classification pipeline. And when we uh, input the short phrase to the mapping pipeline, it goes through uh, processing uh, to successive phases, reprocessing phase, normalization phase, and term mapping phase, and uh, uh, before being uh, mapped to the ontology terms. Uh, in, in the pre-processing phase, for example, we do the data cleaning, uh, deal with the, do the treatment for the case or the punctuation, spelling correction. So these kind of things are done in the pre-processing phase. And the pre-processed phrase is then uh, uh, input to the normalization phase in which we do the normalization, if applicable, 
for the abbreviations for the non-English names. And these pre-processed and normalized phrases, actually, uh, we can say them as the clean phrases. So these are also stored separately if user want to use that because sometimes user, user want to store the clean phrases along with the original uh, phrases or original data. So that is clean phrases. Now the clean phrases uh, are then uh, fed into the term mapping phase in which success, uh, different rules are applied uh, to make uh, the mapping possible. And in that case, uh, uh, if uh, it's uh, no direct mapping is there, then we of course use, use the synonym substitution and other things like the adding fixes and so many other rules are there to make, make the map mapping possible. And once we have the mapped phrases to the ontology terms, it, it can be the basis of many potential applications. And one application which we uh, did is was to uh, use the, do the ontology driven classification. And uh, in that case, as I told you earlier, we, we characterize the third party categories in terms of the ontology buckets, which are the ontology classes. And with the help of those, we actually get the third party class, uh, uh, categories classified for those phrases. And on the top of that, we also have the classification refinement rules, uh, which uh, according to the needs, very specific needs of the user, we have to further refine those categories which have been classified. So one example is uh, in case of uh, genome tracker work, if you have a, a clinical research, for example, and you have a, a animal involved in that, then it has to be classified as the veterinary clinical research. So in that way, we use that class, uh, this refinement rule further. And uh, this is a, how the classification uh, is done. So here's one example. In ideal world, it should be uh, the ontology classes should represent uh, the, the classes which you want to classify. But uh, we know that the third parties have very different requirements than the, how the ontology is being structured or the hierarchy of the ontology is there. So in that case, we see that the subtropical fruit, which is a third party class, so it might be consisting of many multiple ontology, uh, you can branches or classes, uh, which are consisting of this uh, subtropical fruit. And uh, the phrase can map at any level of the, uh, uh, this particular branch, and it will traverse back to the ontology buckets. And those buckets, uh, uh, so we will drive the third party class from those buckets. Also. Two minutes. Okay. So uh, if we want to uh, look at the results, uh, this is the snapshot slide, which is showing you the results here. Uh, so here, the different rules are in play. You can see that in this, uh, column and on the right side column, you see the classification that is being done. So you can see the punctuation treatment and change of case. These are simple uh, example, but you have synonym substitution that is how stool is mapped to feces, for example, and the spelling corrections are there. So you, you see the frozen here in, the, in that case is being normalized uh, before being mapped. And uh, you have the suffix addition, addition for example, also the permutation of tokens in the input. We are also taking care of how the, uh, the ontology labels are, uh, have the problems or inconsistencies. So we take care of that also. And non-English uh, substitution, you see that. And in majority of the cases, actually it's not a one rule, actually it's multiple rules which are needed to enable the mapping of the phrase to the, uh, third, uh, to the ontology terms. So uh, LexMapper is available in the, this particular link is GitHub, for GitHub and Anaconda is there. We also have a, a simple graphical user interface, but I have not put the link there because uh, the server is being moved. So we will put it there afterwards. Maybe. And scalability. So user asks, most of the time user asks whether LexMapper is just for the bio medical, sorry, biospecimen, domain or is, is uh, scalable to the other domains? The answer is yes. We have been testing it for the COVID and Seneca projects actually. And uh, you can select your user specific ontologies, for example, here, uh, you, there, there, there is a tutorial on that. It means it's not a food on or gen appeal. You can have your, your set of ontologies and the part of ontologies. And customization of course can be done for the lookup tables. 
because these are domain specific biosample domain specific tables you can replace them with fewer ones or the uh, augment with them with the additional uh, values and uh, you can also customize like how, which stop words to retain or eliminate uh, with punctuation is to uh, remove or uh, you have want that punctuation to be retained and uh, singularization for example you don't want to you have a, a exception rules for that like you don't want to singularize these phrase uh, words or tokens uh, because domain, domain specific requirements are such that you don't want to singularize those and there are other rules which you can customize and uh, i thank my team members uh, damian emma ivan and my principal investigator william so uh, these are the funding scores we are getting from the different agencies and i will be taking the questions after the session is over thanks thanks for listening thank you green there this was really interesting and i don't really envy you looking at all that inconsistent data entries uh that must be painful um i would like to remind the audience uh one more time about our document for questions and um our final presentation before we take a virtual coffee break is uh, from dr usaki chatterjee and um, after that, like I said, we're gonna have a brief coffee break and then come back to discuss the answers to the questions and further discussion. Uh, Dr. Chatterjee is a postdoctoral teaching associate at the School of Computer Science and Informatics at Cardiff University. Prior to joining to Cardiff, uh, she was a re senior research fellow at Indian Statistical Institute in Bangalore, India. Her main area of research uh, lies broadly in the semantic web, knowledge representation and reuse, domain modeling, information seeking and searching. Uh, during her doctoral tenure, she worked on ontology reuse, uh, where she investigated uh, that people involved in several streams of professional uh, pertaining to food interest uh, to food industries, sorry. Uh, her team was awarded a grant by the Department of Science and Technology in India to visit University of Tranto in Italy. Uh, there she was uh, collaborating uh, the ITPAR project. And she's an active participant in other projects with the No Dive group at the University of Tranto and she's presently presently working on two specific domains recipe and ingredients um i think this presentation will be a great segue to attorneys uh notes about her experiment um dr chairji um take us home please um uh, I'm, I'm trying to share my slide yeah. but it says your screen sharing is paused Okay, let me stop you and then you can restart. How about that? Okay. Okay, try, would you try again? Hmm. So the same. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, would you like me to run your slides for you? Oh, yes, that, that would okay. be fine for me. Yes. Okay, okay. give me one second. Okay. It's opening. Um, all right, all right. I'll stop uh, your screen and I will share mine. All right, you stopped already. Perfect. Okay. Uh, share my screen. Uh, okay, here we are. Um, uh, can everyone see this? Yep. All right, here we go. Uh, let me do the slideshow. Wait, I'm gonna stop. Okay. You can just go ahead and let me know when you need me to change the slide. Sure, thanks. Thanks, Andy. Uh, so just, um, I'll, I'll discuss, uh, this is um, an ongoing project. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. And uh, uh, so this is, um, this, uh, one of the most important uh, yet under-researched factors is the role of diet to address depression in elderly. Uh, next slide, please. 
so uh, we have uh, next slide thank you uh, so these are the uh, so we we have collaborated there are academicians uh, previous slide please andy uh, council members, uh, uh, NHS involved in this project. And uh, next slide. So as I as I said, the context which is um, related to um, uh, 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 a predominant call chronic illness, which is um, depression. And uh, next slide, please. So particularly in UK, uh, all over the world as well, the 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 age uh, population is aging rapidly, and um, uh, UK has a record number of um, adults uh, suffering from chronic disease, and uh, which is adding to overall global burden. And we 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 are trying to address we academics um, and um, the NHS and uh, the council we are working hand in hand to address this particular issue now uh, next slide please uh, so there are several approaches to address depression of course medication is one of them and uh, uh, there are other recommendations like uh, leisure entertainment exercise next slide please and of course um, food so uh, the, um, medical practitioners, dietitians, nutritionists, they tend to recommend uh, 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 food as uh, one of the one of the means by which uh, this particular chronic illness can be addressed. Next slide, please. And uh, traditionally, there are a list of food items that uh, they tend to um, prescribe. And I have just provided uh, some of them. Uh, uh, but the real challenge comes uh, uh, um, when we go out of the traditional prescription. Uh, next slide. So the problem is that um, diet and food preferences, they differ significantly as uh, there are several factors, ethnographic factors, which affect population and uh, influence food choice. And we, in this particular project, we are trying to address this problem. And uh, next slide, please. And, uh, we, we we try to address the, these three aspects: religion, culture, and socioeconomic factors. Uh, and we try to uh, emphasize on these factors when we try and deal with the depression, uh, geriatric depression. So uh, uh, most of us will agree that. Uh, Every, every religion uh, has different food. There is a heavy influence in the choice of food consumed in society. Uh, for instance, uh, Hindu and Buddhist, uh, the, the religion, they, 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 are, they do not welcome consumption of pork and beef. So if, if you visit a McDonald's in India, you would not get a, a beef burger. You, only chicken burgers are there. So uh, uh, also needless to say, there is an influence of uh, culture on food and also uh, the socioeconomic aspect um, plays a huge, huge role. Me coming from a, a developing country, I understand this aspect. So a prescription so-called as an oily fish salmon is not consumed by uh, every household. So uh, next slide, please. So this uh, is the, the background of our work. And today I will be presenting the approach that we have undertaken to build the ontology, which is a principled uh, analytical approach uh, to build a food ontology for elderly. Next slide, please. 
So as I say, it's a principled approach. Yeah, we have enlisted a set of principles and uh, the reason why we have come up with um, what each 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 uh, step is supported by a set of principles. And uh, I'm sorry about the background noise. Please ignore my daughter. Uh, 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 next next slide, please. So the first, the previous slide. So the first step is no, previous to yes. Yeah. Previous to that, yes, yes. Thank you very much. So we start with domain footprint. Uh, slide number twelve. Thank you. Uh, where we have uh, identified, we have participants, particularly from Cardiff University, they were divided in groups and they were given uh, scenarios and they were asked to enlist as many questions as possible based on those scenarios, like what would be the dishes they order in restaurants, food they cook at home, or what would be the food and drinks ordered online, their monthly expenditure, just to get an idea of different so-called ethnographic aspects, the culture, religion, what is their, their um, monthly income and how do they influence uh, their food intake. Next slide, please. So the, the next step is knowledge acquisition. Uh, which involves in identifying terms relevant to the domain. So uh, we, we came up, uh, we saw that uh, food cooked at home, they would cook halal food, vegan food, they would take cheese and wine. So these type of, this type of information provided some understanding of their background, religion, dietary choices, restaurants visited, uh, their health constraints, uh, what would be the, their um, online search typically. So as you can see, the, uh, they search for typical antipasti with prawn, tomato, and basil. So if we have in the group uh, an Italian friend, a colleague, they will understand immediately that uh, this is the, the, there is an origin in common. So what we did, we collected the terms like halal food, budget restaurant, chef, roasted turkey antipasti and we started so this is the knowledge acquisition step and we started analyzing these terms uh, based on the principles which i'll be explaining um, in a bit next slide please and uh, so the data sources we had used we we, we followed uh, we, we looked into different web pages uh, like british british nutrition foundation and other recipe sites ontologies that we looked into are food on bbc food ontology ontology for the care of elderly at home chronic disease dietary consultations using ontology taxonomies used were langual agrovoc and also we followed Wordnet and Euro Wordnet as a part of the data sets. Next slide, please. So as part of the knowledge formulation process, which involved in analyzing the terms which we collected, we, we identified the beverage as wine, uh, diet nutrition specific would be vegan. If the course is antipasti, then the origin would be Italy medical condition would be diabetic, food choice would be chef's special. And we, we went ahead with the definitions and characteristics and it was, it was, um, it was an, uh, quite a rigorous approach. Can, can we go to the next slide, please? So uh, considering a term, say, chef, we looked into different um, sources that I had mentioned. What that Wikipedia, Oxford, uh, and then what we found. Sashi, we, found... we may have lost your audio. Okay. Is yeah. it okay? I can hear you. Sorry. No, we can hear you back in two minutes, please. Okay. So, uh, the, the, uh, so this was a approach of analyzing and defining, redefining the terms. 
Next slide, please. So the the facets that we were we had discovered based on terms and their characteristics identified, we followed uh, principles like principle of um, helpful sequence. So the principle had several subcategories. For instance, if it is uh, something related to um, principle of later in time would be the religion, that how a food came in picture as religion, uh, different religions came in time and place. Uh, principle of uh, bottom up approach, uh, many of the botanists will be uh, will be able to understand that how we uh, how we actually categorize root to fruit um, principle. So so different principles were used. Principle of context, principle of consistency. When we were trying to build the um, facets, we we had to keep these things in mind uh, that uh, the categorization would be consistent and uh, at par with the context. Next, next slide, please. Uh, so when it comes to term standardization, we did look into Langual. For instance, when we looked uh, search for a term like Turkey uh, in, in, in the context of roasted Turkey, Langual provided us with several, several uh, concepts. Next slide, please. And the concept that we chose, uh, which was relevant here was uh, prepared or processed turkey. Next slide, please. Okay, one minute. So, so uh, we we modeled based on uh, the 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 protege approach, the concepts, data properties, and relational properties. And this is just a, uh, just a, an excerpt. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the, here we tried to formalize uh, the concepts, individuals, uh, hierarchical relations and properties associated to uh, the ontology. Next slide, please. And uh, I have defined uh, the, uh, the steps to formalize and we evaluated, based, it was based on a manual evaluation by users and experts. So next slide, please. The experts were chosen from NHS. We had contacted dietitians and nutritionists, professionals from um, uh, from Vail uh, uh, University Health Board, and uh, the users. Next slide, please. The potential users would be the elderly uh, visiting Cardiff Central Library. So this this is what uh, we have uh, in our mind. The, the evaluation path. Uh, next slide. And as next slide, please. And as part of the future direction, what we intend to do is we want to build an app. We we are we are we are working on the prototype, and of course, globalize the system, go beyond uh, UK. Thank you, thank you. Sorry, I ran out of time. That's okay. Thank you so much. And I really enjoyed hearing a focused approach and how you're not boiling, trying to boil the uh, ocean um, on such important um, uh, research area, really. But um, thank you for your presentation. All right, everyone. Uh, this is um, us uh, reaching the end of our presentations. Um, I don't know. I don't know if Tarini is here. Um, but um, I wanted to give you a brief update about her experiment. I don't know if you chose to participate in her experiment and baked a delicious banana bread uh, yourselves, but I know a number of people in the audience did. Um, based on her data, um, many of uh, the participants already enjoyed cooking and um, also were motivated by um, healthy choices. So. She's choosing to write a report on her results, and I, for one, will be looking forward to reading this report. And with that, we are going to take about a 10 minute break for coffee, and we will be back here at about 10.25 to look at our questions and uh, discuss further uh, about the presentations we had today. Uh, please don't forget to add your questions to the document, and I will see you again shortly.
I'll pause recording, uh, Andy. Thank you, Dana. Seems like we are back. There mm -hmm. are many questions um, that were written on the document. Um, I'm not sure if we should go over them and um, uh, have the speakers to um, give a chance to reply in person, or should we um, go ahead and? Uh, what do you? What are you doing? Okay, um, so I missed it. if there was a question there. Um, how shall we proceed? Yeah, I see some of the answers already typed in, but I was wondering if the audience would rather hear from the presenters or um, mm -hmm. how do how do you think we should go ahead and proceed with that? If there's any uh, preference one way or the other. Yeah, um, well, I recall it was pretty fruitful in the past to start with the questions that pitched at each presenter. Um, and if the person is there available online to actually ask the question, uh, then they can do it themselves. So uh, that suggests the first step. Now we didn't record who asked the question, so they'll have to uh, raise their hand or speak up. Um, All right, sounds good. So I see the first question. I don't see a name attached to it uh, for um, Dr. Harks. Uh, thank you for your talk and your method. It is needed uh, that there already exists an ontology in this specific domain that the ontologist is working on. Uh, but in many cases, the ontology is being developed due to the lack of ontologies in the domain rather than to differences of modeling. I'm not sure if Dr. Harris is online. Ian, can you hear us? Yeah, sure. Hi. Uh, yeah, I mean, good question. Uh, I, I wrote my answer in line already, which is basically that um, actually ontologies are becoming so much more widely used these days that it's actually not so easy to find domains that you can go into ontologizing where nobody has uh, nobody has been before. So uh, usually there's at least something you could work with. And, you know, in the worst case, you could even resort to using things like Wikidata or DBpedia, just sort of general purpose ontologies. Of course, the, you know, the granular knowledge about food, say, in there is going to be much less uh, useful, I suppose, but it might at least give you, you know, something. Right. Um, my, I, I guess my follow-up would be um, that for a lot of uh, the ontologies that I've um, come across in bioontologies domain, um, not many axioms are present. And I think, it's, if I'm remembering correctly, your method relied on axiomatic equivalency relationships. Um, so I'm wondering, is there any um, is there any escape from that or is there any way that you can compensate in, in where you have um, not many axioms defining the term? Well, actually the method doesn't assume that there exist any cross ontology axioms. You know, it finds them automatically using one of these alignment tools. We use log map. But, you know, there are a whole bunch of those kind of tools out there. So you can you pick your favorite or, you know, use all of them even if you want. The more of these alignments you get, sort of the better. Um, and, and in bio, bio and life sciences, I would say this is one of the areas where there, there are just a huge number of ontologies with lots of overlapping. So I guess there are plenty of opportunities to try to look for alignments and, and use those correspondences then to, to do some QA on the ontology you're developing. So one, one, one of the angle there is that um, uh, you can, you can apply the alignment tool to just two ontologies that have class subclass distinctions, but not other object relations but, and, and still have a result. Yeah, which um, surely is sometimes very limited, right? 
Mm -hmm. um, Damien, since you're already on, uh, would you like to ask your question uh, following up? Yeah, so um, I, I just, I wasn't clear about how much push button um, operability there was here. Uh, I get that it's not in Protege, but is there a script that you can run that just sort of applies the both the um, alignment tool and then um, and then your um, your tool? Yeah, I'm I'm ashamed to admit that at the moment it's really just like an appalling lash up of sort of using reasoners, mapping tools, Protege, uh, various kind of Linux command line tools, and mm. God knows what. So uh, the, the the simple answer is no, I'm afraid not. I mean, if there's really interest in it, and if it looks like a promising technique, then you know we could put a bit more effort into at least trying to sort of script something actually producing like really usable tools like protege say that that's really problematical for groups like ours who are mostly interested in sort of more theoretical research um you know we don't have the resources or probably even the skills for, for doing that so you know if anyone's out there and wants to take the idea and build a tool be be my guest Mm -hmm. <laughs> it would it would be great to be in a position to uh, uh, at least be able to, if you had instructions to run the two or three tools needed, um, command line Linux. Um, I'm I'm still game. I'm I'm in the game for that because um, it would be great to have something we could iterate. Yeah, I agree definitely. Um, so, um, do you want to continue with your question related to the uh, reasoner, or or do you think that? Um, yeah, let's see, yeah. right, the hermit versus, yes, yeah. I, I'll, I'll deal with the mushroom thing offline, uh, one, uh, maybe just for the audience, one distinction Fudon was trying to make, although not particularly successfully, is um, the distinction between references to whole organisms, the plant or animal food source, and versus the productization of some part of or whole of that uh, organism. And um, we're, we're revising that, but suffice to say, mushroom is an example. When you know, colloquially, when we think of mushroom as a product, it's immediately the top half, the stuff that's above the ground. Whereas the actual mushroom organism can be something that stretches between a <laughs> fungi, between trees in an entire forest and weigh more than a whale. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, that's the space that, um, that one of Ian's uh, logical uh, explorations has has exposed that um, we are mentioning probably some mushrooms uh, directly under food product. Um, and uh, so we're moving to consolidate one thing, which is the NCBI tax on organism references and the plant and animal food source that Foodon invented, stamped uh, IDs for. We'll be trying to consolidate those, which will help. Um, Anyway, that's just a side note. My other question was um, elk versus hermit. Um, if I, so now I understand that the, is it the alignment tool that's um, choosing its kind of reasoner or is the inferential step after that? I think it was after that, right? So would it make a difference to run elk versus hermit or would I be basically um, having the same result? I mean, it potentially could make a difference because um, elk could potentially find fewer subsumption relationships than hermit does. But, mm -hmm. um, it, it, you know, it would still work perfectly fine. It would, you know, potentially find some interesting stuff. And, and as I said in the talk, one of the advantages of working on this kind of tool is we don't really care about completeness or even correctness we just care about kind of narrowing down some regions that we can then feed back to the ontology developers to say, you know, take a look at this. If it's not of interest, fine, ignore it. If it is, then you can do something about it. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. I can see how elk will be a little different myself. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, Usa uh, Usashi had a question. Um, would you like to, uh, how would you like to evaluate this uh, proposed approach? Uh, I'm sure this is domain dependent approach. Right. Yeah. I mean, this was a good question from Usashi. Obviously, one kind of 
weakness in this preliminary paper is that the evaluation is extremely sketchy. Uh, and yes, it, it should be domain independent. And ideally, we'd evaluate this using several pairs of ontologies from different domains. Uh, and then I guess what you would really like to have is, you know, gold standards for correction, but that's unlikely to exist, of course, because if it was there, people would have corrected the ontology already. <laughs> so probably what we would do is just feed the results back and get domain experts to say, you know, 50% of them were useful or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And, that, you know, and uh, like you said, number of ontologies um, also must be a factor in this. And you know, how many can you cross-reference and check with? Um, okay, following. Uh, sorry, yeah. and can I add something, Ian? Just I was wondering uh, whether now that, just uh, prior to my question, you were saying that uh, when you were addressing Damien's uh, query, that uh, this particular ontology, you, you, you were saying that I mean, uh, if if the if the users are happy, then you are happy. Um, so, uh, and uh, I mean, if 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 they are not, if it's not working, I mean, uh, okay, we can try some other um, users. So I am wondering now whether uh, how how would you yeah I mean how would you evaluate because you said that um, if it's if. If it's not working for one expert, you move on to another expert. Um, I didn't mean to suggest that. I just meant that, you know, the only way I could, well, a way I could imagine evaluating it is just do exactly what we did in this experiment, uh, draft in Damon here and, uh, you know, give him the results and say, could you please tell me how many of those are, uh, you know, good and how many are bad and, yeah, I guess if it's giving too many false results, then it will be not very useful because people like Damien will soon get sick of it and stop using it. <laughs> but okay. I didn't mean that if I didn't like the answers that he gave me, I'd just choose another expert until I can find one that says it's great. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Okay, thanks, thanks, Ian. Okay. Um, so I will continue with Anna Maria's question. Uh, uh, Anna Maria, uh, would you thing... like Go ahead. Oh, never mind. Never mind. Oh. Um, I was just wondering if Anna Maria would like to ask it herself, or would you like me to read it for you, Anna Maria? All right. I'll go ahead and give it. A... Oh, there she is. I don't think we can hear you, so I'm going to go ahead and read your question. In addition to cover the similar domain, do the two ontologies needed need to be developed using the same format, BFO or Dolce? Uh, yeah, I mean, not at all. Actually, I'm pretty sure that this isn't the case for Foodon and Hellas. In fact, the design of the two is really quite radically different. But it still, you know, came up with some something useful. Of course, if you had another ontology that did use the same uh, upper level ontology or, or other kind of design concepts, then I suppose the results might be better. Um, but it's, it's not a prerequisite. Yeah, sorry. I mean, I think I'm back now. Yes, you are. Hi. Yeah, okay. No, the, the reason why I ask is because some of different formats can classify concepts in different ways. And so maybe you can lose, like you were, you know, you're saying the case of what you have aligned. The milk, the soybean milk is not uh, the children of soybean food. And that could happen if the format is different because they may be classified in a different way following the different format. That's why I was asking uh, if that was a requirement or is it, if is that is taken in consideration. It, yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. You know, obviously one of the problems here is that the, uh, the sort of higher level design <clears throat> can potentially be radically different. Um, but again, I just sort of fall back to my claim that, you know, I don't really care about being absolutely correct um, or finding all possible errors, 
if I can just, you know, the tool can just highlight a few things uh, without too much noise, then it, then it's already potentially useful. Of course, we'll never develop a tool that identifies every possible error. And I'll just add that I'm correcting the soy and bean classification right now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I can definitely see how the subsumption hierarchy versus axioms. That's why um, I was bringing in the axioms. All right, I'm just gonna go ahead and, and try to go a little faster because I want all of our presenters to answer our questions. Uh, so the next question is from uh, Lydia. Uh, would you, I would like to know how, why you choose the log map tool over the other alignment tools. Uh, did you experiment with other tools or if you plan to on doing so, which other tools would you start with? Right. Yeah. I chose it primarily due to laziness. So I, I had it there on my laptop. So that's the, the one I used. And, it, you know, as I said in the, in the answer on in the document, the whole framework should be pretty much agnostic with respect to reasoners and alignment tools and so on. So, you know, you can use whatever you like there and whatever works works best for you. And uh, yeah, there's probably better tools out there than LogMap, but I was just in the business of, you know, proof of concept. I understand. Um, Okay, I think uh, the microphone is broken, so I don't know if there's any follow up. We'll move on to thank you very much, Dr. Herricks, for your answers. And I'm sure um, uh, he'll be available to contact offline if you have further questions. And I will move on to uh, Patrice's um, presentation and new alignment methods based on food on. I think Damien, if you could get us started, uh, we, could, we can take it from there. Okay, and I was just looking at, just a sec. Oh, right, yeah, um, so I couldn't recall from previous presentations. Um, CQL is a French food database, so I know they have croissant and other French foods as well as cornflakes. Um, and that Langwell matching covers part of the algorithm um, but the other part did involve label uh, stuff. So was food on coming up short in terms of um, helping out on the uh, on the label matching for food products? Um, thank you for the question. Yes, uh, in fact, um, in most of uh, FCDBs uh, we have studied, uh, we are we, we we have English labels associated mm. to food products. Therefore, uh, it will work with uh, most of those FCDBs, I think it is not a, a big barrier. And um, what I, I could mention is more on the techniques we use for lexical matching. For the moment, we, it was the first version of uh, our methods and we implemented a very uh, quite simple uh, lexical matching. It's uh, simply a cosine similarity between a set of lemmatized words uh, when we compared the two terms. And um, it should. Uh, we think that we, uh, we can obviously fine, we can optimize it huh, with more advanced uh, string comparison matching techniques. But my, therefore, my answer is more to 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 look uh, after more uh, optimized uh, comparison string matching methods. It's not necessary to to add new information in uh, in food on like uh, French labels, things like that, for instance. Mm -hmm. okay. Moving on, a uh, question from Alessandra. Uh, I don't know if she wants to ask it herself, but uh, she asked about um, the linkage between Foodon and FoodX2. Um, uh, do you have any preliminary studies, I think is what she meant. Uh, this question came during your presentation. Yes, thank you for this uh, second question. In fact, um, what we did exactly is to, is to map on the parent part of Fudan, uh, because all the food terms of a food concept in this part are all described in Langwall. And um, we took also advantage of the fact that uh, a lot of agencies have uh, described their own vocabulary in Langwall. It is uh, available in the URL I put in the, in the chat. Um, and um, of course, the new question is when in Europe uh, we have to deal with uh, FoodX2, uh, uh, standardized vocabulary, uh, which is uh, 
the vocabulary which, is, which must be used by uh, European food agencies now. And uh, um, I think that some resources uh, exist which permit to map Langwall to FoodEx. Therefore, uh, we have to make uh, some studies about that in order to see if we can adapt our method uh, taking into account this, uh, map, this mapping between, uh, food, between Langwall and FoodEx2. Food Excuse me. If I could add, um, Langwell, uh, the latest version of Langwell has a whole uh, fa uh, product facet, categorization facet for FoodX2's exposure um, vocabulary, as I recall. And we have brought that facet into Foodon with its whole hierarchy of 4,000 codes or so. And our also an upcoming objective is to ensure that each of those matches to a food on a native food category. And so we'll benefit from any mapping work that's already been done in that regard. <clears throat> OK. Thank you both. And another question is um, uh, about combining the two similarity measures from uh, outer cavity, perhaps. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned about the similarity measures you use. I think he wants to know if you, you know, about combining the two different ones. Yep. Uh, in fact, in uh, in our current implementation, it's uh, also very simple. Uh, we only make uh, a mean the mean of the two similarity measures. We have tried some other simple math aggregation function like max function, uh, but it was not successful uh, and. Um, Okay, so we, we are open to any suggestion. Uh, okay, if you have uh, any idea, we're interested in, of course. <laughs> yeah, there, there are many ways to define similarity. Yeah. Um, so the last question for you is from Ian. Um, and he, uh, I don't know if you'd like to ask it yourself, Ian. Sure, why not? Um, yeah, uh, yeah. thanks for the interesting talk. And I was just wondering about uh, if you considered transforming the sources into graphs or ontologies, or possibly they already are graphs or ontologies and using uh, other alignment techniques aimed at graphs and ontologies, because there's a lot of work going on in that space at the moment that you could potentially take advantage of. Yes, thank you for your question. Uh, of course, it is a very interesting suggestion. And um, for the moment, uh, this, uh, the, the work we have presented here is the result of a um, collaboration with some industrial partners. Before <laughs> we, the first effort was to, 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 to understand what they need first and uh, to see how we can uh, answer, to uh, how we can propose uh, solutions before. Um, the, the knowledge resources we used are, are not available in um, as uh, ontologies, but uh, uh, we have uh, we have proposed a, a translation into all of uh, uh, the FCDB vocabulary vocabularies associated with, with language description. Um, of course, our objective is to be able to propose uh, a use case to uh, in a future or AEI uh, challenge uh, to get feedback from uh, people who are interested in uh, alignment methods. Thank you so much. Um, I think that will be very interesting to see how the graphs would uh, play a role in this. Okay, so um, I will go ahead and continue with Liliana. Um, and the first question is again from Damien. Um, so he asked about um, food industry processing is quite detailed depending on machinery. Uh, to model the processing of your selected foods, did you have an adequate set of food transformation processes from food on, or did you need to add new processes for particular kinds of equipment? I will start with a short answer and then I will uh, let uh, Magali uh, to complete because she is in charge with this uh, task. So we uh, we have our case, our uh, pro our project is a news case. We have a very specific uh, itinerary about uh, sausage making, and it is very very precise. And when Magali tried to to represent it in uh, using a concept from Fudan, we discovered 
we discovered that uh, the way to cut meat is different uh, between Europe and even between different uh, 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 country in uh, Europe. So uh, she, uh, she uh, Magali is working on this in a uh, working group with Damien. So I let her explain what uh, how how we managed to add some new processes and new materials concerning this very, very specific use case. Mainly, there she is. Uh, hi, can you see, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you for your question, Damien. Uh, yes, uh, as Liliana said, we have um, a specific use case. So we only have to add um, a very few uh, numbers of equipment so far. But it would be very interesting to interesting to to complete this work, and to and by the way to to know the name of the Cornell project you mentioned. I think this contact will be very useful because indeed we had to complete the list of equipments and materials associated with food transformation process. Um, on a large on a wider range of uh, processes. Um, in our department, uh, food, food research department at INRAE, we are interested in, um, in food uh, and bioproduct and also waste uh, transformation. So I think there is a lot of work uh, to do, to be, to be done. <laughs> okay. Thank you for your nice uh, help on uh, all the ontologies. Uh, right. <laughs> Right. Well, this this particular case actually uh, illustrates the whole reason for the integrated food ontology workshop because um, the Cornell people are actually in, um, the whole department is uh, focused around food safety, and they are sampling machinery inside and out up the yin yang, and they need the vocabulary to identify exactly where they're doing their samples on walls with swabs, different kinds of sampling techniques. And it turns out that interest aligns perfectly, I think, with the, your own interest to describe the very same equipment. They need a loose understanding of what the equipment is doing. They want that descriptive there, but they need the names of the equipment. So there's this kind of a natural harmony between your two projects. And that's what I like to see coming out of this whole IFO effort. Great, great. Yes, I know surf surface is um, cleaning and so on. You know, yeah. it's, it's great. Hmm? I, I think it's really great that if we can synergize some of that efforts coming together, I think that will be super and perfect. I, I'm also wondering if you think uh, Liliana or um, anybody else in the group, uh, just uh, can we find uh, perhaps a minimal information kind of a, or a, or a, um, a, a minimal model, uh, if you were, that we can add on to as needed. And we can also maintain that so that we can use these ontologies together and uh, help them feed each other information. I can start with an answer and the other may complete. I think that our proposal to build this, what we call a PO2 ontology, it's the our effort to have a very uh, kind of unified very high level view because if you try to come to every each domain you will be in a very very detailed description for instance uh, if you want to to build a uh, sausage you are interested in some kind of material some kind we will have detailed what kind of uh, pork meat you will need if it's the swine or the other one so in industry apparently it's very important and if the same composition is in Europe, it would have been not the same for the same industrial partner in the United States, that the recipe will not be the same. So, so if you want really to came to the very little, little, little detail, you will be lost. So I think you need some kind of, this is, this is our proposal to be a little, to lift a little bit, but maybe they will need another, uh, um, intermediate level to aggregate information. Otherwise, it's it's, it's awful. This is my uh, my 
my point of view. Maybe the others want to. I, I agree with your point of view, but I'm um, I welcome if anybody ha has any other comments or experience in doing this or any suggestions or follow up questions. This is very interesting to me and thank you very much for your answer, Liliana. Um, I will, if there are no other questions or comments, I will go ahead and uh, move on to the next presentation from Gurundal Gosal. I hope I'm not butchering your name. Uh, and the first question is from Usashi. And she's asking, uh, you referring to the high level architecture, could you please elaborate on your refinement process? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Usashi, for your question. I think uh, at that particular slide, you are actually referring to the ontology driven classification refinement process, not the ontology refinement process, because the tool does not do any ontology refinement. So, in the case of the classification refinement, uh, of course, we have the refinement rules, which are according to the requirements of the third party, uh, what, what they want uh, with the categories. So two examples I've given here is, for example, there is a uh, original classified class is clinical research, and there is some animal class also involved in that, that is a veterinary animal class, for example. Then we, uh, the refinement rule actually does is to convert that class category uh, classification to the veterinary clinical research. That case. Or there can be another example, like if there are more than one food ingredient is involved, uh, and then we add the multi ingredient uh, to, the, to the classification results in that case. So there, so there are many refinement rules like that. So catering to the needs of the third party uh, how they want uh, those things to be classified. Uh, and uh, if you ask about the LexMapper's contribution uh, towards the refinement in the ontology, what I can say is, is reporting the missing terms. Uh, when we run the LexMapper, then we found so many missing terms which are not there in the ontology. Uh, so that is for the ontology custodians actually to uh, curate and if they want, they want to include that, they can include that. So uh, I think food on owes more than thousand terms to LexMapper. Uh, the, the thousand terms are in food on because of the LexMapper because it found and reported those missing terms uh, from the real data set. So uh, have I answered your question, Sasa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Th thank you for the elaborate explanation. Thank you so much, Kunda. Appreciate it. Is anybody else? Uh, I, I think, um, thank you, uh, Grinder. And um, I see that uh, you also provided a link to the documents um, uh, to for your next question. Uh, so um, I actually, um, I'm wondering, just out of curiosity, if you ever try to um, look at ontologies across domains uh, when you are looking at your rules. Um, um, did you ever try to, go ahead. Yeah, you mean uh, going beyond the food on and genetic ontologies? Yes. Yeah, we are doing that. That's in my one of the slides I mentioned that. So all these things are now customized, customizable. You can select user defined, that means user selected ontologies. So we are doing it for multiple projects actually. Like uh, one oh, yeah, I remember you said the COVID project and all of that, but yeah, I was just, you know, yeah, I guess. The, yeah, yeah, we can do that. Like we can select. Yeah. Uh, I see. And we can also do, uh, customize the other things, like the lookup tables, because those are very domain specific. Uh, so you, you have different abbreviations, for example, in a one particular domain, and uh, you can't have a generalized abbreviation lookup table uh, because people use the same abbreviation in different domains for different things, right? So, yes, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so it is there, like uh, it's, it's, it's the tutorial is there, like how to customize those things uh, and uh, people can go through that. Okay, all right, well, that's, that's certainly very interesting. Do you have a comment, um, Damien? Just that um, normally LexMapper is available online, but we're switching servers um, as we're moving um, our facilities. So it's not available at the moment. 
Thank you for that. Um, are there any other questions or comments from the audience? Okay. I will move on then to the, um, thank you again, Grunder. And um, I think um, well, I had a question for Sashi. Um, I was wondering if you got a chance to look at the chemical compositions of some of the foods that you mentioned in your in your presentation and then try and see if the active drug ingredients had anything to do with uh, some of these chemicals in foods. Um, uh, this is this is definitely one direction, and um, as I as I have written, we are missing an expert in uh, in this this particular uh, field uh, of uh, uh, bioscientists, bio uh, biochemical uh, or food science experts who have knowledge on the chemical composition and drug aspect. And this is key, as I understand, because there are triggers that influence such uh, chronic illness and mental disease like um, depression. And um, oh, one, one idea is to contact uh, medical practitioners, doctors who are there in um, Wales or um, hospital. And also I look forward to uh, collaboration and working with uh, the colleagues here who have expertise in this domain. Uh, so yeah, looking forward to suggestions. Yeah, that is good to hear. And that's interesting. I because I remember in one of the earlier sessions there was a presentation about drug um, drug side effects and food and so I was just wondering if there and uh, I've seen presentations where Kebi is used where you can find some of these chemicals and the related information so I was just wondering if we get a chance to look at it and thank you very much for your answer I really appreciate it and um, thank you. any other questions or comments from the audience um okay one thing i know is that um from the monarch group um they have a maxo ontology that they're trying to bring together different terms from different ontologies including dietary terms that's one reason we started um, working with ifo to develop dietary terms for ons and they uh their job is to tr look for genetic and phenotype um, connections and so i believe their tool their ontology is targeted towards searching for papers that can see disease related um, effects of based on diet so i presume musashi that um, that kind of work will be helpful for you you guys too okay thanks thanks for your suggestion Dani. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's really great. All right. Well, I do have some general questions to our presenters, and um, I would love to hear uh, opinions from all our presenters if possible. Um, so um, I will start from the end this time. And the one question is, um, what are the presenters preferred inference or software for grouping or assigning parent names or preferred descriptions, uh, descriptors from uh, Ahu, Ahuja, maybe? Uh, I don't know if you would like to speak up and ask your question and elaborate on that. Right. Um, uh, is there, uh, Usashi, would you like to start? You, you were the first one uh, to end. Uh, if you have any uh, recommendations, I think that'll be useful for the audience to hear. Sorry, Handy, I need some time as I, I went back to Damien's suggestion and have, I started working on it. I'm so sorry. No I'll get back to you guys in a bit if that is okay. Okay. Well, is there any of our presenters who are ready to answer? And I'll give you some time to, um, and, and the question is once more, uh, what is the preferred interface or software for grouping or assigning parent names or preferred descriptors for terms, I assume? And, um, um, I think that's a that's an important discussion point 
Um, and we've discussed um, with several groups, um, kind of a place like an ontology marketplace of sorts and um, where you can shop for ontologies as it were and see um, how ontologies are evolving. And I know that there, uh, there's some effort in the Obo Foundry, uh, OBI um, um, and others uh, for that kind of uh, help. Uh, that's my knowledge. I don't know if there's any any tools or software. Um, and our presenters, and if you'd like to jump in, fill in, I would appreciate that. I have to say, I'm not quite sure about the question. Um, uh, might have to define the question a little bit more. Uh, if the uh, if the questioner is on online still. Um, yeah, Damon, this is just Preet and um, just Preet the Hujo from USDA. Um, mm -hmm. And um, excuse me, I'm uh, very new to this whole um, field, so I probably don't have the right terminology. Um, but, you know, speaking from what I have, so we've been, um, just to give a background as where am I coming from, is we've been uh, looking at ingredients as listed on the labels, which are, you know, extremely untidy and, uh, you know, and very inconsistent. So, uh, and then we've been trying to give them a parent name or a descriptor, which is more, you know, which is what you would find in ontologies and uh, different classification systems. Um, so this process of assigning, um, you know, and we use some of the existing, uh, systems like the FDA system and uh, NALT, USDA's uh, National Agriculture Libraries. Um, uh, so the ones that are there, but you know, none of these, um, is, like for general food, nobody is um, gonna have the kind of terms that we are seeing on the uh, ingredient statements. So this is kind of a bridge from what's in the commercial uh, ingredient listings to, you know, to the real terms, you know, real food terms. So for that, we ended up doing a lot of that manual, which is doesn't seem like uh, the best way to do it. And I was kind of, um, I kind of trying to write on the experience of all these people over here to find out how, uh, you know, they may have a different domain, but what are they using for similar kind of tasks? I'll just frame that. It's really a text, a text to ontology mapping yeah. challenge. Yeah. yeah. And on the ontology side, we have the responsibility of having the terms to match too. Um, and I'll Gurinder maybe can talk to this a bit. One of our primary objectives was to be able, with LexMapper, was to be able to um, uh, map short textual and uh, descriptions of food to ontology terms to match, and that's in the food product space. So um, the ingredient list, I believe, covers food products, but also um, um, things like salt and iodine and other things that you get into sometimes pretty technical food additive uh, late names and so on are showing up. So I presume that's kind of the challenge as well as all of the linguistics uh, <laughs> that show up in the database around misspellings, plurality and, um, and synonyms. Right. And um... I don't know if any of our uh, presenters have any um, recommendations of tools. And um, like Damien said, there is a cross ontology um, need for this kind of uh, problem, I think, um, where we can um, find many ontologies that are in the same domain, maybe looking at similar vocabulary. Um, together so that we can decide which one of the options is most suitable. Is that um, something that might be helpful? It's just uh, if, if one were to create something similar to what you're looking for. I could say something. Absolutely, please. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously this, as you're saying, is, is like a really widespread problem, how to go from relatively informally expressed knowledge to something more structured and hopefully aligned with an ontology. But what I would say is that there's, you know, again, a vast amount of work out there addressing similar problems. I mean, for example, the, the problem of taking information in knowledge graphs where some of the nodes in the graph were just expressed as strings rather than really entity references to other nodes that that's a well-known problem called canonicalization and there's a lot of work out there that you know employs a variety of nlp and learning techniques to try to do that um and you know you could view your ingredients list on a particular product as a sort of mini ontology and then, you know, try to use some kind of learning and alignment techniques to align that with food on or, you know, some other suitable ontology. So basically what I would say is as a kind of, um, you know, a higher level comment is I don't know specific tools, but, you know, look at the myriad of tools and techniques that are out there and the, uh, and the huge amount of work that's going on in this general area now with kind of graph embeddings and who knows what all else and try to sort of frame your problem in terms of what some of those guys are trying to do and then exploit the tools that they're developing for you then, then you don't have to do everything yourself. One of the keywords there in the field is named entity recognition, NER. Uh, yeah, that. and I guess there's a huge amount of work on that as well that you, you would tap into. Mm -hmm. but, but I mean, in this particular case, I guess that it makes sense not to do it on a kind of ingredient by ingredient basis, but try to exploit the fact that you know all of those ingredients are ingredients of a given kind of product you know which gives you some extra more structured information that you could then you know give some sort of graph learning process a bit more to get get hold of so the more you can exploit the structure you have the, the better i just put in a little thing which is in food on we are really trying to cover all the synonyms because synonymy is one of the big problems um, in that ingredient recognition so our, one of our objectives is to try to cover all the synonyms that you might end up needing to map to a particular ingredient. Yeah. That is a big and challenging problem. And, uh, I'm so glad to hear that there is effort towards that. Or, uh, do any of the other presenters want to chime in before we move on to the last question? Uh, could I just add on? There are there are some nice uh, YouTube tutorials by the Stanford NLP group which I had followed, and I had used them to um, uh, extract ingredients from recipes. So having an unstructured text, following some simple uh, shell programming, I could extract um, of the ingredients and then build an ontology out of those. So um, maybe that can be useful. Uh, one could explore that part. Very helpful, thank you, Isashi. Um, um, any other comments? Um, if, if this is just Rita again, it would be really nice if um, if Isashi you can forward that link. I will. I will just just give me some time. I'll send you the link. Thank you so much. If no you would, problem. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate your inputs. Thank you for your question, Jasprit. Uh, and uh, Sashi, if you want to put the link in the qu uh, question document, uh, that might be helpful for the whole audience. If you could no problem. It. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the final question for this session is, um, while there are academic and perhaps proprietary reasons to develop and explore different approaches, but from a practical standpoint, are there efforts to truly harmonize and align vocabularies and ontologies across the different domains? Great example was the example of different names for trucks in different parts of the country in the world from biomedical, chemical, food, ag worlds, 
what is the component or nutrient? Can machine learning and artificial intelligence be used to hasten the, pro uh, the progress? Um, if the uh, person who was asked the question can speak up and clarify. I, I, I mean, it's clear, but if you wanna elaborate more on it, um, you're welcome to. Uh, I don't have a name on the document, but I think that's an interesting question and uh, I, for one, would very much like to see such harmonization collaboration. So this is Naomi Fukugawa. I'm the one who wrote that question. And that's because throughout several of today's presentations and over the last um, you know, few weeks, we've heard the term component used. We've used the term nutrient, but different people use it differently. So for example, today's presentation, component meant an ingredient. And what is an ingredient versus a component? Because from a chemical standpoint, a component may be the chemical um, compound that is in a food that may induce the biological effect. And I think considering that this is a rapidly evolving field, from a f practical standpoint, I think it's really quite important as food, agriculture, um, health, and you know other concerns about food safety, et cetera, um, you know, is, is hitting the forefront of why we need to be a little more harmonized despite what our individual countries may be saying. You know, is it possible that um, <laughs> one could find a way to perhaps um, bridge much of it. I know a lot of these efforts are, everyone's trying to be bridging it, but from an academic point of view, a lot of times developing your own approach, you know, may lead you down to job security as well as tenure or something like that. But, you know, the world of needing to get things to move on and work for the great good, um, I would hope that there might be a way. I don't know how to do it. And that's why I thought the computers might be able to do it for us. Can I jump in on this one? Of course, go ahead. Thank you, Naomi. I agree with Naomi. However, one of the lessons that I've learned in the past couple of years is that if you're in your own specialty, you're capable of defining what you actually mean in the term, you're way ahead than everybody else. <laughs> And I know that sounds a little bit cynical, but the truth is just the, if you know what you're talking about or trying to talk about, then it gives you a reference point in order to which to compare and link to other people. And the truth is in the majority of cases, people are just not there. Right. So, you know, I guess, and that's why I think we're trying to um, imply, I'm not an ontologist just to make it very clear. Um, but, you know, to try to employ these approaches to help make the connections between the expertise in different areas. You know, um, and I thought, you know, the fact that, of the trucks was a great example, but it's similar in terms of how one might describe a food product or a chemical or whatever. And I guess that's what hierarchies are all about. But you know, I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> Go ahead. No, I was just going to say I have some comments, but I really want to hear about uh, hear from our presenters as well if they have any comments. So go ahead, Damien. I, I think I interrupted you. Well, no, man. I, I think maybe yeah. Let's throw it out to the floor. I do have some comments too. But... <laughs> All right. We'll hold our tongues for now. Okay. And um. um do any of uh, the um, people in the audience or, or our, uh, do any of our presenters have a comment? Well, I guess I should say that I'm not seeking a, a specific okay. answer, but maybe, you know, um, sort of take, I mean, getting an idea of where we could start right. to begin. Right. You know, in a sense, we're doing it, you know, with food on for the USDA food composition data system, but then we've since learned that there's so many other ontologies that we somehow have to work into. Um, and, you know, thinking about food processing preparations, recipes, and so forth. I just am totally <laughs> boggled as to how one even starts. 
and I um and um one of the things that we have actually experienced with um in the bioassay realm um is um trying to use these different ontologies together to annotate uh, even readable text. We've actually come across um, um, ways we were able to employ some machine learning ways to um, to help with the process of determining um, what can be actually um, correlating to something else and can we create some rules based on that. And, and there is progress towards that kind of a thing. And um, We've actually, it, like I said, it's very domain specific. It's in the bioassay realm, but uh, conceptually, uh, it it is. I think it is possible. I've seen it happen. But I'm wondering if there are any other ways that anybody else tried um, in their work or seen as as a purely academic study. Can I just make a comment, please? It's, it's Liliana. So I work, I'm a computer scientist at, uh, my, as a background, and I work in different domains, in chemistry a little bit, in food safety a few years ago, and now in food transformation. And uh, the, the problem I see is that, okay, for the truck, it was very simple to everyone to see that there are different names of different ways of naming the trucks. And it's, uh, it's obvious uh, for normal people to see this, but for a computer scientist and ontologist, it's, I think it's very, very complicated. You need years of experience to understand that uh, the very specific term in a, in a very specific domain, we worked with uh, experts in uh, sensory, sens uh, sensing sensitivity, the taste and aroma and flavors and things like this. I didn't understand the very um, precise way they defined it. So um, I don't have the answer. I think uh, we need to, to work together more to try to find uh, an agreement and to, uh, uh, to better define every uh, way you use terms. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's this exactly the same. But if you use it in a chemistry domain, it will mean something. If you use it in a um, uh, study concerning uh, food uh, analysis or uh, risk analysis, it will be uh, some. Uh, it will be something else. So I don't have the answer, but I know it's a very complicated uh, uh, problem. So I'd like to say I think. The great thing that ontology allows is terms in in a in an ontology that have different definitions, and that you can reflect that a bit. Uh, that that change in sense in the label, so that people can understand that uh, diet doesn't just mean one thing to one person and something else to someone else. And I'll just say the whole reason um, the IFO integrated food ontology work group, as opposed to the workshop. This is the workshop. There's a work group that um, we started up this spring around diet terms, because diet was a classic example of a term that was had different semantics for different people, um, including some of us like me who are kind of ignorant of the neurons. So I'm just gonna screen share um, the results of that process, which is that, um, we started realizing there are different senses of diet and each of them gets a label uh, and its sense of definition. So we're not stuck in an ontology with just one term called diet. We get to break it down and reflect the different senses in the, in the label. So I feel like this is one key basic step that the ontology, gift that the ontology folks can offer other professions to say, we can bring in your senses and have them all under one roof so that we can compare um, diet by food organism and you know the, the kind of thing that you're eating or diet by um, a prescriptive diet um, and, and so on. So this, this uh, hashing through these definitions has occurred through a multidisciplinary group of people um, uh, from different um, sector. So a lot of nutritionist input, but I expect to see the same kind of process happen with other groups around terms that are semantically seem similar, but have variants. Okay. 
Um, thank you for sharing this, Damien. This is very interesting. And um, yeah, I can absolutely see how it can get out of hand. Like Liliana said, this can get very complicated and out of hand very quickly. Um, I'm wondering if um, anyone else um, had any success by um, being a little um, ignorant of the different voices and deciding uh, perhaps a very, in a very uh, undiplomatic way to say, okay, this is the data set that I'm going to deal with and this is the set of terms that I'm going to deal with and then let me see if, if computers can help me. Um, is there any experience like that from anyone in the audience? Um, Where there's one aspect that I'd like, and I'm sorry, I'm going to jump on my soapbox again. If just knowing what you're talking about does not mean that you're right, but at least everyone knows where you stand. <laughs> That's true. Yes. Uh, and if you can derive your terms from an authoritative source, and let's, for example, use regulations or laws, which are not necessarily right, but they are right according to a certain standard, you're, you're ahead of everyone else because we know where you stand. And the value to my, if you use standards such as Al, one of the things that you can state categorically is you disagree with someone by stating Al different from. And there are a very a number of ontological tools that you can use to differentiate yourself from other people by saying that I mean this, but I don't mean that. And that's a way to build yourself to a certain truth by saying I disagree with these people. I think that in many cases, disagreement is what builds the agreement. You know, that's a very good philosoph philosophical point of how we should approach it. And I think the people that I've sort of encountered in this field seem to be willing to do that much more than some of the more established fields <laughs> that exist in science. So there is hope. <laughs> I if, really care. <laughs> so. yeah, it reminds me of sort of a there's the vocabulary used in science, and then there's a uh, the vocabulary used within regulatory worlds. Right. So, tomato, vegetable, fruit, um, that kind of thing. So, but I, I do still put a plug in. You can actually just differentiate your labels, uh, classes, um, fruit regulatory, fruit biological, that kind of thing within one ontology. But I like your point, Warren. Uh, yeah. And um, all right, well, this, uh, we have two minutes left. I don't know, Damien, if you want to wrap it up. Uh, thank you again for this question, Naomi. And I think that everyone will keep thinking about um, this. I know I will. So um, I don't know if you want to have a brief closing message for us, Damien. Thank you everyone for being such an engaging audience today. I appreciate it. And uh, thank you to the organizing committee for this a multifaceted uh, workshop. This was really good. Yes, and thank you, Handy, for hosting. Uh, well done. And to the whole, um, the whole audience that's come in um, to this, it's been great in the last four weeks. And just to say that um, the proceedings, for the most part, uh, will be present, will be available on the Integrated Food Ontology Work Group um, GitHub repo. And as well, all of this happened, of course, virtually. Uh, we were all supposed to be sitting in Bolzano, enjoying the mountains and discussing uh, <laughs> our problems there. I believe that the intention is for us to make it real uh, next year, and that um, same folks will all, can all be invited to um, come in and and pitch the presentation, what will be really fascinating to see how the work has progressed a, a year into it all. And then as well, we'll have a little bit more of a focus on uh, conference proceedings and getting um, the material published. This time we, we kind of avoided that level, partly because it's all new. This is all uh, congealing as, a, as an integrated scene. And, and I'm really appreciating everybody coming in together to, um, to add, create this, um, this this unified landscape of food. So thank you all.
yeah, for helping out and supporting this. And we'll see you next year. Thank you, Damien. Thank you. And everyone. Thank you, Damien. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Andy, Damien. It was great. Thank you. Good. All right. Um,